The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this 30th webinar on the Secret Doctrine. This and all subsequent webinars will be available on Makara.us under the subheading Moria Federation Webinars. Um, I, I want to interject here. First of all, I hope you are all staying uh, healthy wherever you are in the world. And um, uh, also, this, this webinar may be shorter than usual. Um, since I'll be doing four presentations at the coming conference, uh, uh, there's my time is at a premium. But if there's a lot of um, attendee interaction, we may cover the whole time. At any rate, we'll be doing the first two verses of Stands of Four. So, as is our habit, we'll start by checking in on HPB's travels in India as described in old diary leaves by Colonel Henry S. Olcott. The S I discovered is for Steel. Can you imagine having a middle name, Steel? Last month, we read about HPB clairvoyantly reading letters from a Mahatma by holding them to her forehead. This month, we have a longer reading that takes place on a houseboat on the Buckingham Canal. It's in India, but it's called the Fucking of a canal. We could almost call this a special edition of these diary leave excerpts. A note, the term coolie, which denotes a class of laborer, is nowadays considered pejorative. As to whether it was so considered in the time of these diaries, it's you know difficult to determine. But the fact that Olcott and HPB championed the Indian working class at every opportunity suggests that certainly no prejudice was intended by its use in these diaries, but it appears three or four times. Okay, so um, if we could get four readers, let's just, we can uh, determine them as we come to each page. So uh, just a reader for this, please. Okay, Joe, can you start us off, please? Sure. A houseboat journey with HPB. In all our years of intercourse, HPV and I had never been so closely drawn together as on this boat journey on the Buckingham Canal. Hitherto, we had lived and worked in the company of third parties, whereas now we two were alone in a budro or small houseboat with our servant Babala and the coolie crew as our sole companions while the craft was in motion. Our quarters were cramped enough to be sure at either side of the small cabin was a locker covered with a mattress, the lid arranged to lift on hinges, the inside forming a huge chest for storage of one's effects. Between the two lockers, each a bed by night, a chest of drawers by day, was a portable table which, when not in use, could be folded up and hung from the ceiling, a lavatory, a small pantry with shelves, a cooking platform outside behind, with a broken earthen pot bottom, laid on sand for fireplace, and some few indispensable cooking utensils, a large jar for drinking water, and our camp table furniture completed our domestic arrangements and sufficed for our wants. When a fair wind blew, a sail was raised and we glided before it. When averse, the coolies jumped ashore and with the tow line passed over their shoulders, dragged us along at the rate perhaps of perhaps three miles an hour. Our destination was the town of Nellore, a two days journey by water. Okay, uh, another reader, please. Karen, can you read that for us, please? Sure. As we had not started until 7 p.m., 3rd May, 1882, and the moon was almost full, it was not a sort of ferry voyage we were making on, I'm sorry, on the way. Sorry, it was. It was uh, a it was, oh, sorry. It was a sort of ferry voyage we were making on the waveless silvery water. No sound broke the silence. After once leaving the city limit, limits, save the occasional yelps of a pack of jackals, the low murmur of our boat coolies' voices talking together and the lap lapping of the water against the boat. 
In place of glass sashes, windows, there were hinged Venetian blinds with hooks to fasten them to the overhead deck beams at pleasure. And through these, a gentle night breeze blew cool and brought us the smell of wet rice fields. My colleagues and I sat enchanted with the scene and refreshed by the grateful and unaccustomed rest from our life of excitement and publicity. We talked but little, being under the witchery of the night, and went to our beds with the certainty of a refreshing sleep. Thank you, Karen. Um, I've quit presenting them um, because they, they're so repetitive, but they continuously um, were presenting before audience of 5,000 people and then being, you know, uh, they were like rock stars. They would be met at the dock when their boat would arrive by thousands. And, you know, you, and you remember this, these readings, I'm, I'm sure, from uh, months past. Um, and they just, it happened so often that I quit, you know, presenting them. So between every novel entry, such as this one, there's been, you know, half a dozen of those types. So that's what they're, you know, taking a, a, a rest from. Okay, next up. Vaughn, can you read that for us, please? Sure. Wafted along by the breeze, our boat sailed steadily throughout the night, and morning found us well on our way. At an early hour, we tied up at the bank for the coolies to build their fire and cook their curry and rice. Our people in the boat, in the other boat, joined us. I went for a swim and Babula cooked us a capital breakfast. Then on once more, the boats as noiseless as specters. HPB and I occupied the whole day with arrears of correspondence and editorial writing for the Theosophist, with occasional breaks for conversation. Of course, the one theme for us was the condition and prospects of our society and the probable ultimate effect on contemporary public opinion of the Eastern ideas we were spreading. In this respect, we were optimists in the same degree, no shadow of doubt or difference crossing either of our minds. It was this ever potent, overmastering feeling of confidence that made us so indifferent to calamities and obstacles, which might have otherwise brought us to a standstill, 50 times during our career. Okay, so the Theosophist uh, is a, uh, was a, a monthly publication uh, and the society that there's, he speaks of here, of course, is the Theosophical Society, which was dedicated to spreading the um, ancient or the ageless wisdom teachings as they appeared in Eastern writings. So, um, okay, and then finally this last Michael, can you read that for us, please? Okay. Our forecast dealt with the coloring of modern thought with theosophical ideas far more than with the possible extension of the society throughout the world. Of that, we had practically no expectation, as when leaving New York for Bombay, we did not even dream that the society might cover India and Ceylon with branches. So now, on that silently moving boat, we gave no thought to the possibility of its creating a popular agitation that would plant its branches and create its centers throughout America and Europe, to say nothing of Aust Australasia, Africa, and the Far East. Why should we? To whom could we look then? Where were the giants fit to carry such a heavy load on their shoulders? This was but in 1882, remember, and outside Asia there were but three branches of the TS in existence. We two old people in the boat were practically managing the thing alone, and as HPB showed no more prophetic gift than myself at the time, we built our foundations for a great future that neither of us foresaw. 
how many of the present multitude of fellows of the society would give almost anything to have had the close intimacy I enjoyed with my friend on that boat journey. What made it all the pleasanter and more profitable was that she was in good health and spirits, and there was nothing to mar the charm of our companionship. Otherwise, I might almost as well have been a cage companion of a hungry lioness at the zoo. Dear lamented friend, companion, colleague, teacher, chum, none could be more exasperating at her worst times, none more lovable and admirable at her best. I believe we have worked in lives before. I believe we shall work in lives to come for the good of mankind. Yeah, I was very moved by this passage. You know, it suggests that uh, it was written um, later. A lot of the diary takes place in real time, but this seems to be a reflection uh, on a rereading after HBB had passed, right? And uh, we tend to forget that um, the Theosophical Society was hugely popular. Um, around the turn of the century and up through perhaps the 20s. And it was known by everyone and all over the world, you know, from Adyar uh, to, you know, branches uh, in California and in um, um, the north, I think, uh, Michigan or Minnesota, I can't remember which. But anyway, it was um, uh, was truly worldwide. And so he's speaking of a time when it was truly just at its beginnings. Okay, um, we finished last month by taking a look at an extended excerpt on the Kumaras from Initiation and Human and Solar. And perhaps you remember, um, this was in reference to um, some commentary, HPV commentary. We'll begin today by rereading verse one of stanza four. I'll read this. Listen, ye sons of the earth, to your instructors, the sons of the fire. Learn, there is neither first nor last, for all is one number issued from no number. The first paragraph commentary, which we reviewed last month, deals, you may remember, with a passage from chapter 8 in the Bhagavad Gita, wherein Krishna associates the day, the waxing moon, and the six months following the winter solstice with a release from incarnation. And the opposite cycles, night, the waning moon, and the six months following the summer solstice with the need to incarnate. Obviously, Krishna's association is not literally connected with the time of one's death. Otherwise, everyone dying between the winter and summer solstices would be freed from the necessity of rebirth. But it is descriptive of the most and least propitious times of the day, month, and year. And I suspect there's a blind in here somewhere, veiling some higher teaching. Um, be interesting to know just what. So we're just going to move right on since we went over this last time. And this is, uh, except for this little small paragraph in the beginning, um, it's new material. So now we pick up where we left off last month. Um, can we get a reader for this in to this section that's in black? Frida, can you read that for us? You're self-muted. Okay, I'm not getting anything from Frida. So let me go down. Um, Ishtar, can you read that for us? Yeah, sure. These terms, the sons of the fire, the sons of the no, fire no. mist. Hang on, hang on. Sorry. Started oh, the, I... the black, okay, right. Further down, sorry. That's fine. The Agnishvata, the Kumara, the seven mystic sages are solar deities, though the former are Pitris also, and these are the fashioners of the inner man. 
See book two. They are the sons of fire because they are the first beings in the secret doctrine they are called minds evolved from primordial fire. The Lord is a consuming fire. Deuteronomy 5.24 The Lord Christos shall be revealed with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Second Thessalonians I seven eight. The Holy Ghost descended on the apostles like clever tongues of fire. Acts two five three. Vishnu will return on Kalki, the white horse, as the last avatar amid fire and flames, and Sosish Sosisho will be brought down equally on a white horse in a tornado of fire. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him is called the Word of God, Revelations 19.13. Amid flaming fire, fire is ether in its purest form, and hence it is not regarded as matter, but it is the unity of ether, the second manifested deity in its universality. But there are two fires, and a distinction is made between them in the occult teachings. The first, or the purely formless and invisible fire concealed in the central spiritual sun, is spoken of as triple metaph metaphysically while the fire of the manifested cosmos is septenary throughout both the universe and our solar system. Secret Doctrine 86. Seven. Thank you. Okay, a lot of information, um, but a lot of it is examples of, these, the, of this primordial fire. So any thoughts or questions arise from this? The Agnishvata were also Petris, it's a statement made here, because they reincarnated in order to, quote, fashion the inter, inner man. Petri is like pater, which means father. Um, we also covered this point last month. So up next, we, within... Yes, yes. I'm sorry, you've got a hand. That's good. No apologies necessary. Uh, go ahead, Martha, you're self-muted. There you go. I, I just wanted to ask, the central spiritual sun is described as Alcyone, is, isn't it the, uh, one of the Pleiades? Oh, well, that's a different spiritual, central spiritual sun. That's, that's um, this, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, BL, but I believe that's the sun that is considered to be the center around which um, we are revolving. Uh, but this central spiritual sun would be um, the triplicity of the, the uh, physical sun, the heart of the sun, and the central spiritual sun, all related to our solar logos. And um, they have to do with uh, the levels of the cosmic mental, which is where the, the, the central spiritual sun resides and where the essence of the life of our uh, cosmic logos, of, of our solar logos is. And then the heart of the sun um, being the heart center of, of that great being that we call the sun. And these are interestingly, uh, even though you can imagine them being overlaid in some way, they're not considered to be part of our solar system. And that's because they're on transcendent cosmic realms. But no, this has nothing to do with um, the, of the identity of some visible sun. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for asking the question. It's, it's a good one. Um, okay, any others? Okay. So up next, within our solar system, the sons of fire are the mind-born sons of the Dhyani Buddha of around. We're looking at this last week, or last month, I mean, uh, whom Deparukar 
in a quote we read last month, calls the wondrous being in whose, quote, ray runs through all individual beings. Ray here meaning essence, not like, um, well, you could even say it's, it's that ray of deity that runs through all beings. Uh, the Dhyani Buddha of a round, um, whoops, here we go. The Dhyani Buddha of around oversees seven globes of our Earth's chain. We've covered this before, but it's, you know, it's such a con confusing and elaborate system. It's, it's, you can almost never go over it too much. Around represents the passage of the life essence through a chain or globe. And so these Dhyani Buddhas are of that uh, traveling life essence through a series of seven globes, okay? So this description of, well, first of all, are there any questions about this nomenclature? I mean, you get some sense of how extraordinarily tiny our, our little system is, right? If you look at the bottom there, that where it says seven sub-races, well, we're in the fifth sub-race of the fifth race. And it takes, the last race was Atlantean. That's the second level up, which is millions of years ago, right? Which, seven of which uh, constitute a globe of manifestation, right? Um, and then you have those making up the chain of the nurse scheme, which, uh, and then there are seven planetary chain schemes in our solar system. So that's our little system. But then, and, and this is just about as far as, um, as um, DK ever goes. He talks about the one about whom not be, may be said, who's made up of seven, uh, of seven solar systems, right? right? So, um, and then you can see that that's just one of seven, which is one of seven, which is one of seven, which is one of seven. And that takes you to one of seven, which are the seven spheres before the throne of God. It's inconceivable, especially when we consider that somewhere in the middle of this descent is one about whom not may be set. So it's, it's really unimaginable. And at the very top of, of my understanding of this third, second, and first logos uh, is, are the cosmic manifestations of all existence, all existence in all multiverse, universe, whatever, all existence everywhere, right? And there, there's no specificity uh, as to the particular universe involved in those highest levels. And who knows exactly where it kicks in? Like, you know, which dot represented here, for instance, is a galaxy? It's, you know, um, it's hard to say, right? But we know there's trillions of galaxies. So it's, it's an awesome <clears throat> reality that we're a part of. Okay. Now okay. We can move on. Yeah. Uh, Yvonne right? says, where is the diagram from so I can further understand it? Well, let's see, I should have had the uh, TCF reference in here. Gosh, I'm wanting to say, it's in the last 200 pages of TCF. There is a, I'm sorry, I don't have this. Let me, I'll uh, look it up, I'll look it up for you. Yeah. It's in, yeah, I'm thinking 1100s, somewhere in there. There's, those charts are close together. There's, um, yeah. right in that area there. I'll so, look it up uh, and I'll put it in the, uh, <laughs> chat box to everybody. It's in the last section of a treatise on cosmic fire. Normally, I have the um, reference in the right corner, but I missed it this time. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Oh. The Dhyani Buddha of around oversees seven globes. This description of the sons of fire is followed by numerous references to related states of fiery being. They don't, just because she listens sequentially doesn't mean that they mean the, exactly the same thing. 
um, but they all relate to related states of fiery being. It's important to remember that fire as Lord consumes that which blocks our spiritual progress, never harming our true selves. That's a, especially important to keep in mind when we're talking about the, you know, the white horse of the apocalypse and this the fiery ending of, of the apocalypse, right? Um, this may signal the end of, of um, form existence for the time being, for that cycle, um, but uh, never of uh, spiritual being. Okay. Okay, this statement, fire is ether in its purest form and hence is not regarded as matter, but it is the unity of ether, the second manifested deity in its universality. Well, what we run into here is the difference between the way the term ether was used in HBB's time and how it's used by DK. So this AE ether, in a sense represented the substantive aspect of everything beyond the cosmic physical plane. Um, and that's not absolutely um, always clear either because uh, the theosophy of HPB's time wasn't nearly as spelled out as what DK gave us later. Uh, but it doesn't mean the, um, the four subplanes of either the cosmic physical or the, um, the cosmic physical, uh, uh, physical, <laughs> you know what I mean? The four subplanes of the uh, physical plane that is the seventh of the, of the cosmic physical plane. Who would know? That'd be so hard to communicate. You know what I mean? I think most of you as studiers of DK. It doesn't mean that tenuous, um, formative aspect of the material, right? It's, it suggests matter and at its highest levels. That's why she's saying, and I said all this because she says, it's, it's not regarded as matter because this is a different reference. Still uh, matter from the point of view of substantive in the levels beyond the cosmic physical, um, but not um, what we think of as a theory. So, okay, Francis. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, Karen says, does it mean consciousness? So let no. me. Okay. All right. And then Yvonne has her hand up too. Yeah. Go ahead, Yvonne. Uh, Francis, I'm confused by this. Lord is a consuming fire. Is this Lord Agni of the mental plane? Is this the, the God of consuming fire? Or, or is this the solar logos we're playing to? Or is this, you know, way above the solar logos? Uh, you know, wh which God is this that we're talking well, about? Know, yeah, that's a good question, really. Um, Lord Agni is a good guess. What we would have to do is go to Deuteronomy 4.24 and get a sense of reference. But you could say in more general terms that um, all deity is a consuming fire, but that's just the, the nature of the spirit aspect, of, of the deity aspect. That approach to it is um, form reducing or form dissipating. That's the very nature of it, right? Um, form consuming indeed uh but this is you know this is images of you know something burning here on the physical plane are really not accurate because you could almost call it the cold fire of intelligent spirit that is to say in approach in the approach to deity the form aspect inherently dissociates or dissipates right but uh, the specific reference of this um, is, can't be determined unless we were to really uh, um, study the context of Deuteronomy, right? Uh, but I don't think that's necessary because it's, it is relevant to Agni. Um, 
it is relevant to this solar logos. And from another point of view, it's relevant to Shambhala and the Lord being the planetary logos, you know, approach to that uh, is form reducing or form dissipating. Does that help? Yeah, I'm good. Oh. Um, BL will pull up Deuteronomy, figure it all out and tell us later. <laughs> right, <Yeah>. right. <laughs> Uh, and you see, you know, it's it's interesting to look at each of these. Um, I kind of purposely didn't get into uh, this because it would be a deep side trip into the Bible. Um, you know, uh, cloven tongues of fire. Uh, you know, that's a visual reference. We've seen how fire has that look of cloven tongues, right? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and I think this this return of, of Vishnu on Kalki, the white horse, is is much like if there's somebody Hindu in the audience, I'm sure they could, or in the is an attendee here, they could um, verify this. But I I don't think it's unlike the um, the return that happens during the apocalypse. Or, um, <clears throat> okay, um, but back to the ether. Are there, first of all, were there any other questions? No, that's all I have right now. Okay, so fire is the second manifested deity because the ether here described as the second iteration of Oya Ohu the Younger. The Ika is Chatur. Remember that reference? The Ika is, this is back on verse seven, which is a few months ago, but it was a kind of a, a watershed verse. Um, the one is four. Uh, we'll get to this in more depth a bit later. The first deity is Narayana, right? The darkness whose breath initiates all manifestation. The second is this stage where the one is four. And um, uh, we'll look at that in a second. Um, finally, in this paragraph, um, we have a comment about the two types of fire, uh, the threefold purely formless fire, the central spiritual sun, references what Martha was asking about, and the septenary fires of manifestation, forming ten altogether. The former is cold because it is as yet devoid of the heat producing energy of rotary motion, and thus is formless but nonetheless luminous to the, quote, opened eye of Dangama. Um, that was a reference way back in, I think it was maybe first stanza, certainly the second. The Theosophical Glossary calls it essential consciousness substance. Thus it is an extension of universal mind. Okay, so, any thoughts and questions on anything in this paragraph? It's very rich. You know, you could we could stay here the whole webinar, chasing down and with good result. Uh, these various references be quite interesting. Um, so let's, uh, if we could, then get a reader to finish this uh, A session commentary. Lynn, can you read that for us, please? One, listen, ye sons of the earth, to your instructors, the sons of fire. Learn there is neither first nor last, for all is one number issued from no number. Go ahead. The fire or knowledge burns up all action on the plane of illusion, says the commentary. Therefore, those who have acquired it and are emancipated are called fires. Speaking of the seven senses, symbolized by as Hotras, priests, the Brahmana, says in an Ayukita, thus the seven senses, senses, smell, taste, and color, and sound, etc., etc., are the causes of emancipation. And the commentator adds, it is from these seven, 
from which the self is to be emancipated. I am here devoid of qualities, must mean the self, not the Brahmana who speaks. Yeah, any, any thoughts, ideas, questions about this short paragraph? In this first sentence, we have the word fire used as both an agency, quote, the fire of knowledge, and as an identity, the fires, suggesting that the disciple becomes one with the agency of his or her emancipation. We've all heard the injunction, the mind is the slayer of the real, and yet it is the mind that slays the slayer. Or as Ramakrishna puts it, I love this, quote, the mind is a thorn. Use that thorn to remove the thorn. <laughs> um, here we have the same idea, but with the mind described in terms of its seven senses, right? Thus, these seven senses are the causes of emancipation. You know, use the thorn to remove the thorn. And yet it is from these seven from which the self must be emancipated. It's an interesting uh, uh, turning in on itself, right? It has a lot to do with perspective, motive, uh, and orientation, right? Once you can identify self outside the senses, then you can use them to reveal that which they are not, <laughs> if you get my meaning. So the Theosophical Glossary expands and clarifies this statement. I'll read it, it's short. In the Anugita, the plural of Hotris, is used symbolically for the seven senses. And Hotris are priests, that's why I use this illustration, which are represented as being seven priests. The senses supply the fire of mind, i.e. desire, with the oblations of external pleasures. Thus these seven are the causes of emancipation. So in other words, once you see this, the senses as um, offerings, oblations, gifts to the higher self, and no longer see them as reality itself, right? Then you can use them to release yourself from them. Okay. And yet, oops, uh, it is from these seven from which the self is to be emancipated. Thus the slayer of the real slays itself, or rather its attachment to that which the self, the senses reveal. This is the mechanism that transformed the seeker in the statement, I am both the seeker and the sought. Okay. It's, it's, it's the, maybe the shortest way of saying this, I am both the seeker and the sought. That which is identified with the uh, personality vehicle and the soul vehicle. Then when this realizes made, you could say, I am both the senses and what the senses uh, emanate from or uh, have as their higher counterpart. So any thoughts or questions about this? Um, it's, you could call this a true philosophical problem or conundrum, because it's definitely a conundrum. Okay, then let's move on to the short B section, which references, learn, there is neither first nor last, for all is one number issued from no number. Can we get a reader for this? Just the B section there at the bottom. Antonella, can you read that for us, please? Yes. The expression all is one number issued from no number relates again to that universal and philosophical tenet just explained in stanza three comma four. That which is absolute is of course no number. 
but in its later significance, it has an, an application in space as in time. It means that not only every increment of time is part of a larger increment, up to the most indefinitely prolonged duration conceivable by the human intellect, but also that no manifested thing can be thought of except as part of a larger whole. The total aggregate being the one manifested universe that issues from the unmanifested or absolute, called non-being or no-number, to distinguish it from being or the one number. Okay. So any thoughts or questions? So we have yet another uh, philosophical conundrum. So let's take a closer look at the statement, all is one number issued from no number. The first all being a descriptor of plurality indicates manifestation. All is one suggests that this plurality <clears throat> is fundamentally a unity, a collective unity. All is one number suggests that that unity exists in the realm of spatial quantity and incremental time. Following the phrase, <clears throat> excuse me, following the phrase, all is one number, we have the greatest of all mysteries. And I don't say that lightly. This is, this is the biggie issued from no number. No number here referring to the absolute which being beyond the realm of both spatial quantity and incremental time is beyond number itself because it is beyond that which number quantifies. But as Michael Robin warns, no thing is not nothing. It is rather pure beingness. So any thoughts or questions about this? This term issued is we actually have no one has any idea. Sometimes you see it termed reflected. I, I literally, when we were doing the first two stanzas, I combed the secret doctrine trying to find any explanation or indication of what, of how the absolute uh, issues the, the uh, manifested universe or multiverse, right? And you see terms like issued, reflex, but this is the great mystery. Um, and, you know, anybody that tells you they know uh, just hasn't read enough to know that they don't know. It's the, we stand in complete unknowingness before the realm of no number, right? Okay. So any thoughts or questions about this? Okay. <clears throat> that which is absolute is of course no number, but in its latter significance, it has an application in space and time. So HPV here relates the absolute to manifestation through the term application, and before I was saying reflection or issues for it, here she's saying um, <clears throat> that it has an application in space and time, you know, thus suggesting that manifestation carries something of the beingness of the absolute. And that's, that's all I covered here because I think the rest is, um, repeated largely yeah no matter how large the increment uh, or definitely prolong the duration it still is part of number right that's what she says here at the end um, always the distinction um, um, Michael Robbins um, if you're a fan he he loves this topic and you know he talks about uh, infinitudes and in, in infinitesimals, right? 
And he said the largest imaginable quantity or uh, form aspect, no matter if anything in manifestation, is an infinitesimal in comparison to the absolute. Basically because it's, they are not relating in terms of bigger and smaller at all. It's, it's of beingness as opposed to of manifestation. Okay. Okay, then let's, that's it. Um, no, we'll take a look at the verse itself now, um, which is, listen, ye sons of the earth, to your instructors, the sons of the fire. Learn, there is, there is neither first nor last, for all is one number issued from no number. For all is one number issued from no number. We have in this first sentence, listen, ye sons of the earth, to your instructors, the sons of fire, a fundamental duality. Sons of the earth, the sublunar or form aspect, and sons of the fire, the solar aspect, whether cosmic or systemic. But in fact, there are three levels represented in this statement. Can you find the third one? The third, which is actually the first in terms of prim primacy, is fire itself, right? You have the fiery suns are the first to issue forth from this formless primordial fire or svabhava through the agency of fohat. And the fact that they are our instructors identifies them as prototypes of the solar angelic kingdom. So you have this fundamental unity, unity represented by the fire. Then you have the sons of the fire which are the seven Prajapatis, um, Diani Chohans, Ray Lords, however and wherever you find them. And then on the uh, other end of the, that, um, that uh, polar opposite, you have the Sons of the Earth. Okay. The verb listen links the two groups and that listening is only possible through an agency that first becomes available to us by means of the soul. There's so much hidden in the, this verb listen as used here, what is actually being listened to. It's not likely a secret in the form of a series of spoken words, though there are words of power given at initiation. More probably, this listening re references the coming into awareness that is made possible through the sense of hearing. The treatise on cosmic fire gives the higher correspondences to this line of senses as clairaudience on the astral plane, higher clairaudience on the mental plane, and comprehension on the buddhic plane all leading to beatitude, which means, at least exoterically, supreme blessedness. So, first the A-U-M leading to the O-M, this is all part of the sense of hearing, which in turn leads to the sound written in all capitals, the music of the spheres that reveals the life aspect through identification. For only in this identified state can one truly comprehend. There we go. <clears throat> can only truly comprehend the teaching. Learn there is neither first nor last for all is one number issued for no number. Listening and learning, as here used, 
are the two components of the buddhic plane capacity of comprehension and is thus beyond the subject object orientation of the intellect in fact the instruction referenced this verse is so understated encompasses the entire evolutionary path which will eventually propel us beyond the veil of sequential time where the first and last are known as one. All this is veiled by the terms listen and learn. Any thoughts or questions on verse one of stanza four? It's truly a profound verse and it hides under the simple and terse language. Okay then. Up next, verse two. Learn what we who descend from the primordial seven, we who are born from the primordial flame, have learnt from our fathers. Let's take a look at the commentary. Um, this is it in its entirety. Could we get a, a reader for it? Um, Carrie, can you read that for us, please? Okay. Just starting at A, Carrie. Yeah. This is explained in Book 2, and this name, Primordial Flame, corroborates what is said in the first paragraph of the preceding commentary on stanza 4. The distinction between the primordial and the subsequent seven builders is this. The former are the ray and direct emanation of the first sacred four, the Tetrarchis, that is the eternally self-existent one, eternal in essence, note well, not in manifestation, and distinct from the universal one, latent during Pralaya and active during Mant Mantau Manvantara, the primordial proceed from father, mother, spirit, Hyle or illus, whereas the other manifested quaternary and the seven proceed from the mother alone. It is the latter who is the immaculate virgin mother, who is overshadowed, not impregnated, by the universal mystery when she emerges from her state of liar or undifferentiated condition. In reality, they are, of course, all one, but their aspects on the various planes of being are different. See part two, Theogony of the Creative Gods. The first primordial are the highest beings on the scale of existence. They are the archangels of Christianity, those who refuse, as Michael did in the latter system, and as did the eldest mind-born sons of Brahma, Vedas, to create or rather to multiply. Thank you, Gary. So, um, another prodigious commentary. Uh, any thoughts or questions on this? So concerning this reference to stanza four, um, the sentence that, as far as I can tell, the sentence that best relates to the primordial flame described here seems to be this one. Um, we're back to the verse we just finished. Uh, the fire or knowledge burns up all actions on the plane of illusion. Therefore, those who have acquired it and are emancipated are called fires. These fires, HPV seems to be suggesting, become one with the primordial flame of, um, of this verse. So I think that's the reference she meant. Francis? Yeah. Martha's got her hand up. Yes, Martha. Martha, you're self-muted. There you go. Um, this is really basic. I'm, I'm, there, something really important experientially happened uh, at the beginning, listen and learn. 
So I'm coming, I'm not coming from an intellectual place. It feels to me that what's going on here is the actual, um, uh, an insightful penetration into the way energy works itself, which mm -hmm. is about drawing one in and up and then it differentiating itself as needed. And so it's almost like a, a watching a film. I, I, that's what I feel like in this explanation. What, and so I'm just trying to slow it down a bit to make this more tangible. Am I on the right track? <laughs> in other words, if you, if you extrapolate, if you, if you stop seeing what's being said sequentially mm -hmm. and, and in an organized fashion and you try to see it, wouldn't yeah. this be almost a scientific description of watching uh, how energetically force and energy are interacting with one another or something? Yeah, very much so. Very much so. First of all, uh, you know, you were saying it wasn't intellectual, but it was, a, I think, a, a brilliant insight into this extraordinary verse. You know, it's so easy to move beyond this. First of all, it's short. So, you know, you're like, oh, let's see, where's the juice in this stanza, right? And believe me, the, the rubber hits the ground and in verse three. We'll be there next time. Uh, but it's an, it's a, it's almost in the, uh, in the nature of a preamble to what he's about to actually tell you, right? Uh, but it's, it's profound in uh, ways that I think you were able to catch. It is, uh, especially like what you said in the end there, it, it really does describe the interaction action between um, uh, energy and force. Um, for those, in DK speak, Force is a function of the centers within your body, including your head centers. Uh, and energy is that which impacts those centers. So, for instance, the soul is energy because it um, influences uh, the, uh, the force fields that are generated by, by your centers, right? So that would be a sun of fire. Of course, it's, it's not the primordial sons of fire that stand before the throne of God, but it is, you know, a spark of that fire, your, fire, your own solar angel, right? Um, so it's, it's very useful. In fact, probably more useful to look at it at that level, that uh, the impact of the energy field of any son of God, which is any solar angel, very specifically your own soul, um, is in terms of energy and and uh, force. And it's you know it's it's not accidental that uh, you know he used the terms listen and and learn in this way because it's um, sound has a profound um, way of transforming, you know, the logos itself, the lo logos means sound or the emanation of the word, right? The word going forth might be a translation of logos, right? And so <laughs> listen is the word being received. But when you think of all that's received from any logos, um, including the planetary logos, then that gets more into what's going on here, right? So excellent, Martha, thank you. Uh, she, she says, uh, thank you, Francis. Your response provided a bit of space to take in the enormity of what she is saying. Appreciate oh, this. Oh, yeah. yeah, boy, you, you hit the nail on the head. You know, um, one of the problems is with a sequential uh, webinar like this is that so often you move off of the material way before we're really ready to do so, like we just have, right? Um, if, if it were, it almost makes me want to um, introduce meditation into these webinars. This isn't, you know, this material 
uh, needs to be approached in two ways with, with, the, uh, with the lower mind. But uh, in order to gain a sense of the, of the uh, concepts um, and the images, et cetera, the language, translating, um, but much more importantly, in higher mind, this whole thing is oriented towards stimulating um, the uh, illumination that occurs on the higher mind, which is informed by the intuition, right? In fact, it's informed by all the Buddhic senses, so like comprehension, which, you know, we just looked at, all right? Um, where was that one? Going back here, this comprehension. So these are the, um, you know, this is that line of hearing that uh, is really being indicated in this listen and learn, you know, give and receive. Okay. Yeah, uh, it, sometimes it just moves on more quickly than uh, is necessary to really um, bring it in. But that's the way of these things. Okay. <laughs> Where the heck are we? Let's see, we did this, right? And then we looked at that. And then we were talking about, let's see, where are we at here? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, here we go. All right, so, let's see. Yeah. So there were uh, a dozen plus references. Um, to the you know, going back to this book two, um, this is explained in book two, which is the second volume of the of the Secret Doctrine, right? Um, we'll get there sometime after, I'm guessing, 2025 ish. Um, it's a terrific read, by the way. Um, but anyway, there were a dozen or so references to this uh, primordial plane, but here's here are uh, three that I felt were uh, uh, particularly relative and informative, interesting too. Uh, so let's take, let's get three readers for this. Um, okay, let's start with Martha, then Lorraine, and then Yvonne, please. So um, to start it, as to Enoch, that paragraph. Yeah, I'm finished with it. Okay. As to Enoch, Toth, or Hermes, Orpheus, and Cadmus, these are all generic names, branches and offshoots of the seven primordial sages, incarnated, Diane, Chowens, or Davis, in elusive, not mortal bodies, who taught humanity all it knew, and whose earliest disciples assumed their master's names. This custom passed from the fourth to the fifth race. Hence, the sameness of the tradition about Hermes, of whom Egyptologists count five, Enoch, etc. They are all inventors of letters. None of them dies, but still lives. But they are the first initiators into and founders of the mysteries. So this is, you could say, the seven, the seven great teachers um, and in the defining aspect here is the inventors of letters. You know, for instance, Hermes Trismegistus, uh, which means thrice great, of uh, um, was just basically introduced knowledge to the uh, Egyptian. Um, he he initiated the Egyptian mystery school, right? Uh, and you know, God knows when that came down. Um, and there's been uh, other teachers, a few of which named here, Orpheus, Cadmus, um, that, uh, um, and Enoch, <clears throat> Toth, who um, were also great teachers in their time, and they passed into mythology or even into Godhead, like in the case of Toth, right? Um, but they were a, a certain aspect of these seven uh, Prajapatis. Okay, so second reader, please. 
Those who were born within the sphere of operation were the brothers who loved him well. The latter, the him, were the primordial angels, the Asuras, the Achriman, the Elohim, or sons of God, of whom Satan was one. All those spiritual beings who were called the angels of darkness, because that darkness is absolute light, a fact now neglected, if not entirely forgotten in theology. Nevertheless, the spirituality of those much abused sons of light, which is darkness, must be evidently as great in comparison with that of the angels next in order, as the ethereality of the latter would be when contrasted with the density of the human body. The former are the firstborn, therefore so near to the confines of pure quiescent spirit as to be merely the privations, in the Aristotelian sense, the pharaohers or the ideal types of those who followed. They could not create material, corporeal things, and therefore were said in process of time to have refused to create as commanded by God, otherwise to have rebelled. Thank you for that, Ray. Um, any thoughts or questions about this? This sentence, <clears throat> the form are the firstborn, therefore so near to the confines of pure quiescent spirit as to be the ferulers or the uh, ferulers or the ideal types of those who followed. This describes a flame-like primordial seven. Ferrurs is a Zoroastrian concept, meaning ideal prototype. That through a bit of serendipitous synchronicity, we looked at during the last Secret Teaching of All Ages webinar. Um, okay, well. Uh, there's a, a, an extraordinary teaching here, and I, I'm hoping that you are somewhat aware of it. If not, it, it can't be glossed over. This idea of, of darkness as esoterically used, meaning absolute light. In other words, that source of light, um, which is so tenuous in its existence that it is not registered in the same way light is, represents extremely high planes of being. And what's important uh, to understand in this, uh, about this, these um, sons of God, who, such as um, the Asuras, the Ariman, the Elohim, um, of whom Satan was one. Do you know how brave HPB had to be to write this? I mean, can you imagine the condemnation that came just from that sentence, right? Um, all those, they were all called angels of darkness. Well, anybody that's influenced at all by exoteric religion, no matter what it being, but especially Christianity, knows what the thought forms around angels of darkness are, and about Lucifer, et cetera, you know. It's a mistaking, a fundamental mistaking of this idea of the war in heaven um, and the idea of, of um, darkness itself, you know, which they're mistaking for the darkness of evil. But this is, in fact, the other extreme, the highest darkness, right? I've always been interested in, in I thought it was interesting that Satan, you know, I mean, it's hard to even say the name, you know, and, and see it in these terms and but look at what an anagram it is with sanat it's just two letters shifted right so um of course we you know intified the thought forms associated with the lower and there are certain names that really are descriptive of the lower like beelzebub etc right um but this is not that level why didn't they create what was the, you know, what was the rebellion? They were not capable of creating because they were not um, manifest at a low enough level to be creator gods. So anyway, uh, if we go on now to read that third one, third reader. Go ahead. Like like each of the seven regions of the earth, each of the seven firstborn, the primordial human groups, receives its light and life from its own especial Diani, spiritually, and from the palace, house, the planet, 
of that dhyani physically. So with the seven great races to be born on it, the first is born under the sun, the second under Rahaspati, Jupiter, the third under Lohatanja, the fire-bodied Venus or Sukra, the fourth under Soma, the moon, our globe also, the fourth sphere being born under and from the moon, and Sani, Saturn, the Cura, Lokani, evil-eyed, and the Asita, the dark, the fifth under Buddha, Mercury. So also with man and every man in man, every principle, each gets its specific quality from its primary, the planetary spirit. Therefore, every man is a septinate or a combination of principles, each having its origin in a quality of that special dhyani. Every act of power or force of the earth comes to her from one of the seven lords. Thank you. A good job on those uh, uh, Sanskrit words, by the way. So this phrase, um, and each we, of the seven. I'm sorry, we have a question when you have a moment. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, let me see. Yeah, go ahead, please, Ishtar. I guess. Hi. Thank you, Francis. Um, I found that very interesting, uh, your description there about the sons of light, which is darkness. Mm. and uh, quite fascinating um, to put the archangels in there. And while you were speaking of that, I, I came, I had this um, analogical um, imagery also, and it, it, it came as a black hole. You know, a black hole consumes all light, mm. uh, but of course it appears as darkness and also a magnetically drawn within, which means it doesn't produce outward. Yeah. That it's, was just a feeling. Right, right, right. You know, this, of course, we've had, you know, there were no black holes in DK's time. And mm. we, so we have no source uh, reflections that, that you, I could say sources that I would trust who has reflected on the nature of a black hole. Uh, you can look at you know, we can look at it in a couple of different ways as being um, super um, uh, material because it draws all materiality towards it. And so mm. it's, it's kind of the densest possible density or, and you know, this is, it's hard to refute this idea that it's a, uh, a center of first reactivity of un, you know an unprecedented first reactivity because it absolutely destroys the forms that it draws to it you know disintegrates them um, but we don't really know what happens because the light is how we gain all our information about <clears throat> those forms being drawn into the black hole at some point goes out because the gravity is is of such an intense nature that even light can't escape it, right? right? So there's all kinds of metaphors, but how do you apply the metaphors? You know, I wouldn't want to say it is X or it is Y. Um, yes, I agree with you, but it was just an analogic no, way no. to view this text. I'm a very, I'm a person who has visual imagery as like somebody else who was talking that makes sense, you know, rather than text. But yeah. it is a very fascinating um, piece of um, information there. It is, and it certainly is um, an exponent of some reality. We just don't know what. You know, I'm talking about some spiritual reality. Something yes. is being, you know, is happening there. It's being described there. And, mm. it, and and the ray one, what you just described as ray one was very interesting, actually. Very interesting. Yeah, it strips out the form aspect. I mean, you know, just that's that's what it does. I mean, the, the, the for, fourth law of the soul is, um, uh, which is ruled by ray one. Um, you know, the difference is if you get near uh, a black hole, it doesn't ask permission. But, for <laughs> the, you know, 
you're just, you're gone, you know. Uh, <laughs> but I would think, and you know, all of this is hypothesis, that just like Pluto, the influence of Pluto and Vulcan it can't directly affect the spirit aspect, right? Right. Uh, light is the highest, highest form of, of, um, of, of matter. And if there's, if you need proof of that, boy, there it is. I mean, Einstein proved it when he bent it, you know, when in observation, it was seen to bend around gravitational objects, you know, such as planets. But boy, we have a much, much uh, more graphic illustration of that with this black hole, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it, we know what it does to physical plane. We don't know why or, or the effect that it has on spirit. <laughs> right. Yeah, maybe it's but thank you. the threshold of a great deity, you know, maybe you certainly could make a, an argument based on, you know, what's been uh, seen, what's been uh, major. You could make an argument for it being deity or deific in that sense, you know. Yeah, it's uh, like Shiva. Yeah, it's like Shiva. You could certainly make that argument. You know. mm, beautiful. Um, yeah, good. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, so let's look at this sentence. Each of the first of the seven firstborn, the primordial human groups receives its light and light from its own special Diani spiritually and from the palace house, the planet of that Diani physically. This references the seven root races, which are energetically overshadowed by the Diani or logi spiritually it's important to realize uh mentally and as determiners of their physicality so the diani determine their um their spiritual mental and uh, physical um being that is another way of seeing that as the um they provide opportunity for those who resonate with that particular diani to go through their process of becoming right um each of the root races right and each of the root races as you know are sequential they run through seven sub races um which also are going to be overshadowed um by certain energetic fields which is the best way to look at this okay HPB uh, addresses this in the next paragraph. Uh, back to our commentary. The distinction between the primordial and the subsequent seven builders is this. The former are the ray and direct emanation of the first sacred four, the tetractus, that is the eternally self-existent one, eternal in essence, note well, not in manifestation and distinct from the universal one. So the sacred four, are the primordial four elements described in the commentary on stanza three, verse nine. Everybody remember that? Uh, just kidding. Wherein HPV says, the four primal natures of the first Dion Chohans are the so-called, for want of better terms, Akashic, ethereal, watery, and fiery. Answering in the terminology of practical occultism, to scientific definition of gases, which to convey a clear idea to both occultists and laymen must be defined as parahydrogenic, paraoxygenic, oxyhydrogenic, and ozonic, or perhaps nitroozonic. But the only one of those, um, of this bottom group uh, that actually exists is the ozonic, the, uh, the others are uh, super sensuous, you could say, but she's suggesting that these are in fact the four, right? And define that initial stage of becoming in terms of the evolutional cycle. So it is these four that are originally described in verse seven of stanza three, so second visitation to this, the Ika is Chatur. Ika means divine dragon, right? Remember, he was the refulgent dragon of wisdom. 
Nothing in the commentary tells us as much about Oya Ohu the Younger, the initiating singularity of this manifestation, as a revelation that it is fourfold. That allows us to place him, it, this singularity, in the, sequen the sequence of um, involution. For one thing, it relates it to the Tetractus. Could we get a reader for this excerpt? Carrie, can you read that for us, please? Yeah. The intelligible world proceeds out of the divine mind or unit after this manner. <clears throat> the Tetractus, reflecting upon its own essence, the first unit, productrix of all things, and on its own beginning, saith thus. Once one, twice two, immediately ariseth a tetrad, having on its top the highest unit and becomes a pyramis, whose base is a plain tetrad, answerable to a superficies upon which the radiant light of a divine unity pr produces the form of incorporeal fire by reason of the descent of Juno matter to inferior things. Hence ariseth essential light, not burning, but illuminating. It is termed Olympus, entirely light and replete with separate forms. Where is the seat of the immortal gods, Deum Domus Alta, whose top is unity, its walls trinity, and its superficies quaternity. Rauklin Kabbalah. The superficies, I don't know how you pronounce that, superficies? Well, as, the superficies. Superficies, ah. I thought it was Latin, but <laughs> okay. The superficies has thus to remain a meaningless surface if left by itself. Unity only illuminating quaternity. The famous lower four has to build for itself also a wall from Trinity, if it would be manifested. Thanks, Thanks. Carrie. So if you think all the good stuff is just in volume one, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a profound read straight through, right? Even though volume two uh, is no longer commentary on the um, on the stanzas. It's nonetheless uh, an amazing volume. So, any thoughts or questions about this? It's a extremely dense but um, uh, powerful stuff. Right? In this statement, HPB describes the numeral nature of the Tetractus, the quote productress, productrix of all things, which must, quote, build for itself a wall from Trinity if it would be manifested. So why do you think that is? Why does it need to build for itself a wall from Trinity? Well, the resulting seven, uh, and Chatur takes to itself three, and the union produces the Sapta, seven, in whom are the seven? <laughs> are the flame-like primordial spirits referenced in verse one and two of stanza four, the verses we've been studying. At the highest level of meaning, the Tetractus represents Svabhava, for both the Tetractus and Svabhava unify the one with the all. It's both spirit and matter. Thus, both are symbolic of the law of nature, the eternally self-existent one in four that govern all manifestations. So to answer my own question, um, why does it need to take to itself this trinity? Well, the seven, that three is going to be the, the lower three, not the trinity we normally think of, but the three that stand below the, the four what we normally think of as etheric, and therefore they're formative, right? <clears throat> okay, um, back to the text. 
HPV you, here tell yeah you got a hand uh, go ahead there go <clears throat> ahead oh, thank you Francis I thought that that was quite interesting that the tetrax um, has the seven dots which can be seen as the three aspects at the top and then the um, seven attributes or is it no the four attributes yeah, four attributes. Oh, I'm missing. I, I think three I'm aspects. missing. Yeah, three aspects, four attributes, yeah. Uh, I didn't see that right because it's the 10, isn't it? It's not seven. No, it's the 10. But seven okay. is, is an important part of this because note that um, the two bottom layers are seven, um, which is in keeping with the idea of, of, of uh, manifestation. But if if you look at the point in the center, which is the only central point in yes. this, everything else is on the periphery. And then you look yes. at the circle of six that surround it. Mm. Then you have a, an equally uh, important seven, um, yeah. which is the six of manifestation and that source point. Of right. The one the center, right? So you Beautiful. have, yeah, you have a dual uh, metaphor here. It's actually much more than dual. But um, yeah, those are two important aspects of it. And seen that way, right, we do, in terms of uh, indicating deity and the manifested worlds, we, we use two methods, um, the above and the below, and the, mm -hmm. within, the within and the without. And the tetractus is, illustrates both because you could see the point in the center, the seven surrounding, and then circumscribed, that's not quite right, triangulated by the three outermost those points, right? Wow. So you can, that's a very much within, without way. And then of course you have above to below, right? It's a, a yeah, it bears a lot of study. We could spend some time just going back through the um, the qualities here represented. It's just quite fascinating. And for that reasons, if you know, if you just can't live without more knowledge on the Tetractus, then reincarnate in ancient Greek times because this was the <clears throat> the holy grail of of the Pythagorean school, right? Okay. They, um, and Very interesting. probably much more has been lost in terms of their knowledge about the Tetractus than we have figured out since, right? All right. Um, okay, thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, you're welcome. Okay, so here. All right. So, um, let's see, did I read this? Dr. Swan things be managed that the result was seven. Yes, 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 I did. All right, so back to the text. Yeah. HPB here tells us that the primordial seven proceeds from Svabhavat, or father mother, whereas the quote, other manifested quaternary, um, meaning the four cosmic etheric planes, actually I've modified that. Uh, proceed from the mother or form aspect alone. You could see, you could even see that in terms of the four ethers um, or the four substantive um, primordial uh, uh, aspects like para-oxygenic, uh, para-hydrogenic, etc. Um, but that they proceed, um, that they represent, I'm getting they represent the father-mother aspect, um, but the purely physical aspect is the mother aspect. Um, yeah, during this process, the virgin mother, uh, during the process of this, of the latter uh, a manifestation, um, the virgin mother, whose primordial substance or Mula Park Reedy, remains forever unchanged. Finally, HP references the archangels and the Vedas, as opposed to the Vedas, the Vedhas, 
the Christian and Hindu counterparts to the seven spirits or ray lords who, quote, refuse to create. There's no real refusal there. Uh, because they were of such a rarefied spiritual nature that they could not, as HBB says, create material corporeal things. It's an important understanding. It's a very esoteric understanding. And hence the uh, sacrifice of ones such as Prometheus, you know, the rock he's tied to is um, his physical incarnation, right? And that eagle that comes every day and picks at his liver, that's cyclic incarnation, right? Um, and Lucifer, that, that great sacrifice, the, the reason he's fallen is that he fell into form. The greatest of all sacrifices uh, for one of such high uh, stature in order to, in, to uh, instigate um, the fire of, of mind right, in humanity. Okay. Um, any final thoughts or questions about anything in this brief? Whoops. Yeah. We have a hand up. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Hi, Francis. It's, it's me again. How did that all get turned around with Lucifer and Satan and the fall and all that? Uh, so negative, you know, I have friends that say, oh, Helen Borowski, she's a Satanist. She, she worships Lucifer and all this. And then, you know, Satan and all the angels, they fell. And I, I you know, I understand what you're saying. They just were too, too highly evolved to create on the physical plane. But uh, where did it all go wrong? Uh, probably at the, uh, maybe Martha Gallagher could help me here, but I would, I would point the finger at the Creed of Nicaea. Um, at some point, that was one of the places where things moved away from the original message, right? Um, well, the motivation shifted from being a, a means of enlightenment, I'm talking about the, the message from Christ, to a doctrine to consolidate power in an institution which in this case was the church, right? This, is okay. always, this, this always represents the downfall, right? And so in order to make people flock to the church, what better way than to create a devil, you know, that they will definitely be going to hell if they don't come to church and give them their money, by the way, right? Wow. It's, a, it's a means to... A, a very evil and materialistic means. I hear the Irish in you, Francis. Could I, <laughs> could I just offer a, just a little bit of a nuance on your <laughs> beautiful... On my, on my <laughs> diatribe? <laughs> um, the fathers of the church, and I, and I believe the real disjunct was between Paul and John, and that Paul was the supreme communicator of very hidden mysteries. And as we know in the New Testament, but he, as he was also articulated. Anyway, what came up very early, which was a conundrum, was the dilemma between Gnosticism and something that would create actually the beloved community. So, it was kind of like the descent of the, you know, beloved community to try to translate some of the abstruse understandings in the culture of the time. So if, you know, like if we think we have patriarchal, our patriarchy now, that kind of stuff was, you know, wild. So the, the, the level of conscious in the, in that, era was not the level that the Greeks had attained, that there, there was a paradox where for somehow for Christianity to land, it gave up an awful lot of this internal meaning. So it, it, the failure of translation in the end was really, it was, be, it was even before the church really was uh, a church. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I accept that. 
as you are. <laughs> I, you know, when you bring on things like the Inquisition, uh, and then you what? can see a calcification of these uh, yeah. erroneous beliefs. This, all, this happened before that. This, oh this, yeah, oh I know. Satan yeah. was, you know, he was in, he was there really, really early, and oh. and it was an issue that you know the the Gnostics had embraced both sides, but you know they didn't necessarily live lives that spoke to kindness and universal um, caring for others. So it uh -huh. was just a complicated failure of translation in some way. Interesting, yeah. And we tend to forget the vast amounts of time um, that uh, that exists between the the Gnostic movement, which is just after the time of Christ, um, uh, some say during and after, uh, and even the first um, um, church fathers, you know, that there was a couple of hundred years before the church really uh, had codified its doctrine, right? And and so most of that was after the fact, you know, their um, uh, re refutation of, of Gnosticism was after it, it had pretty much died out. Of course, there's even today vestiges of it, but that original movement anyway. And then you have another 800 years before, you know, for instance, the um, common use of, or at least 700, before the common use of, of the Inquisition, for instance. So these are, you know, there's huge amounts of time involved in these um, developments. Francis? Oh, yeah, I'll just one, ahead, thing, one thing I would just say, in the course of unfolding Christianity, there were also these very light beings, like um, Helen of Bingen, you know, the New musicians, Meister Eckhart, all those, they were moving back into incorporating evil into the dynamic of life itself. It just, yeah. just that they couldn't, they weren't, they were so high, John, but they were, couldn't be um, understood, you know, so it, yeah. it was also there. It was, that was, it was also in, there. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, and in some cases, they had to be really careful with what they said. Um, and if they weren't, they would, you know, fall astray. Uh, the, the the church fathers of the time. Um, I know that a lot of the early, well, we ran into this, you know, when we were looking at the, that first chapter of Secret Teaching of All Ages, that these early philosophers um, really, uh, you know, they were exercised for, the beliefs that they put forth, you know, so because it it uh, was considered a foul of the church doctrine. So um, the Dutch, you know, introduced the idea of independent philosophy, but even um, uh, even those early Dutch philosophers uh, suffered under this onus, even though they weren't burned, they suffered from it. Thank you, Martha, for this dialogue. I appreciate it. It's always yeah, we interesting. Have, we have more comments on it, too. Um, okay. Lynn says HPB and ISIS unveiled that Arrhenius and others were the ones who changed the original materials. Mm -hmm. And then uh -huh. Ishtar, Ishtar says uh, from Islam, Christianity, uh, Christianity adopted a djinn or djinn, evil elemental being as Satan. In Islamic tradition, uh, Iblis is often identified with al Shaitan, the devil, often often followed by the epithet al Rajim, the accursed. Okay. Well and I hope I didn't butcher the saying of that. Sorry, Ishtar. <laughs> and thanks for that. That's interesting. Uh, in both cases, um, ultimately Hell, uh, and the source of evil, of course, is the personality selfish, separative aspect. Remember, there's only one sin, separativeness, right? And all sins um, issue from that one sin. Um, you know, 
So, you know, when you're looking, for, if you're out there looking for a devil to blame, um, it's, you know, it's the personality aspect, but it serves its purpose too. It is all part of the process of becoming and evil is relative. Um, I can't remember who said, you know, the least one in the kingdom of the fifth kingdom or the kingdom of heaven uh uh it, it makes the the very greatest of the of the human kingdom seem like a you know a heinous devil because there's this uh just a shift from third aspect to second from from personality to soul consciousness um is a game changer in every way. And so in all of this, we have metaphors for evil. Um, and I don't doubt that there are entified beings, you know, that they exist. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, putting much stock in them or blaming them uh, is misplaced um, because usually the real cause is closer to home, right? Okay, anything else on this? Uh, yes, Martha adds, Arrhenius goes back to the second century. Yeah, there you go. All right, which is, gets back into Gnostic times. By the way, if this is fascinating to you, I recommend um, the next webinar on Secret Teaching of All Ages, which is June 7th, we'll be moving into Gnosticism during that webinar. It's probably be a couple of webinars worth on that really interesting topic. All right, let's see where in the heck we are. Okay, so we go back up here. Yeah, here we go. Um, so any final thoughts or questions about, let me get back, yeah. Uh, anything in this brief commentary on verse two? Of course, we've now moved beyond it so much um, that uh, it's hard to bring it back to mind. If not, let's take a, a closer look at the verse itself. This verse, learn what we who descend from the primordial seven, we who are born from the primordial fire, have learned from our fathers. Seems to me, this verse seems to me to be an extension of verse one and together form a kind of preamble to information given in the final four verses. Um, not to say that they're not profound in their own right, especially verse one. Um, but uh, in fact, the only new info in verse two is three added references to the fire, interestingly enough, described in verse one. From these three, we learned that the fire is a sevenfold primordial flame which represents the father aspect. The theme of stanza four is the septenary. Okay, is it let's take a a quick look. Any questions about this chart? You see on the left we have the information that came from verse one, you know, in addition to the the profound um unpacking of of the idea of listening and learning right but in terms of that which is referenced we have the fire the sons of fire and the sons of the earth in verse two we have we we discover that this fire is seven a primordial seven a primordial flame and represents the father aspect which of course we had some sense of before so, um, okay. So the theme of stanza four is the septenary. It, this is the stanza we're coming into that these two verses introduce. Um, and instead of doing it now, because we're out of time, next time, um, and this is literally my last slide. Do you believe it? Um, <laughs> perfect. So that's good. Um, so 
we'll save this for next time. And it's, I think, a very relevant uh, exegesis on the number seven, which will help uh, introduce the, uh, the quality of this um, stanza four that's, that's really, in some ways, begins with the next verse. So that's it this time. Um, Our next one is 17 May, after the conference. Um, they're still finalizing the information for the conference. It's, of course, been transformed. It's an online conference. I would have liked Michael Stacy to talk about it, but he had to go to another meeting. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's the 28th of April to the 10th of May, and they're finalizing um, the schedules and the um, the announcement for it. So hopefully we'll be seeing something out soon. If you're not on the conference mailing list, you definitely need to get on it. If you haven't been receiving updates along the way about the progress of, of this unfolding conference, um, let, let, uh, let BL know. Um, and uh, she'll send you um, a link. I'll point you in the right direction on the oh. Moira Federation so that right. it's, it's the contact or it's the um, join us or something. Anyway, yeah, contact me okay. and I'll, I'll point you to the Moira Federation website where you can um, sign up for the list that you're interested in signing up for. And uh, yeah, this is Michael, and I'm in a Zoom meeting as well as this webinar. That um, BL is correct. There, there will be uh, information coming out shortly uh, on um, the Seven Rays Conference. It, there will be information coming out through Constant Contact. Um, contact BL, or you can contact me also uh, to get you signed up into Constant Contact. Um, the uh, it's a faculty meeting on April 28th, and the ceremonial uh, pre-conference is the 29th and 30th. The uh, astrology pre-conference is then on May 1st, and it will follow, be followed by a Ray pre-conference, and then the actual uh, full conference begins on the 4th or 5th, I forget. I would just urge you to consider the fact that this this is not in any way reduced. We it, it, it it's a full on <laughs> conference. You're, you're going to have uh, the same presenters, the same quality of presentations that we've had all along. Um, having been behind the scenes here, but I know this is the fact, right? This is a really serious undertaking to port the experience that you have in. Uh, Chandler, Arizona, to port that to your computer, right? It's actually a, 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 a fabulous opportunity to plug into uh, this material. So um, I urge you all to sign up for the conferences. And also, because it is online, uh, you don't have travel costs, and the, the suggested donations are much less than the uh, in-person conference. Right. No travel, no hotel, no um, three restaurant meals a day, you know. Um, but uh, I hope to see you there. It's, I think it's going to be terrific. Um, and so this will be the last webinar before the conference. Uh, see you on the 17th. And I'll be presenting four, count them four, uh, presentations during the conference. So I hope to see many of you um, signed up for those presentations. Okay, ta-ta for now and be well, stay safe, um, and see you in mid-May. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.